What's up everybody? Welcome to Inside the Game, your one-stop shop for everything cool in video games. If you want to be a part of the show, then head to insidethegame.ca where there you can submit your cool clip and end off our show. Now did you know we're also on YouTube and Twitch? Twitch.tv slash the official ITG streaming Monday to Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern. So swing by and check us out. This week we got a jam-packed episode. We're talking about the Rainbow Six Siege Battle Pass. Is it any good? Is it worth your cash? Stick around and find out. We also have a preview on Wastelands 3. A whole lot more on the show, so stick around. But first, here's the inside scoop. Finally, after five years, Space Engineers is finally available on Xbox. After four million copies have been sold on PC, here's what you can expect when you dive in on the Xbox. So there's a couple ways you can actually get the game on Xbox. You can actually download the ultimate version with all the DLCs for $30 USD, or you can download the base game for $20 USD and just download the DLCs as you want them for an extra $5, which is actually pretty cool. So you don't have to commit fully if you don't want to, but really for $30, $35, that's a great price for a full game. And there's a lot of differences coming through from the PC now onto the Xbox port uh, just to start. So you gotta watch out for a few things there, but as they go, they said they're gonna be updating the game consistently and we're gonna be getting a lot of different things coming into this game. And hopefully a lot of the PC stuff we're gonna see on the Xbox side of things as this game progresses. But I think with all the success it's had over the last five years, this one's gonna be a huge game for the Xbox. Well, it seems like each and every week we are talking about COVID-19 and the fact that we're doing social distancing. But to help ease that pain, PlayStation's helped us with the Play at Home initiative. So what games are we playing for free? Well, if you haven't dove in already, Uncharted, the Nathan Drake Collection, and Journey will be available as it might be rotating by the sounds of things as well. If this keeps going, we might experience other titles. But to start us off, we're starting with these two titles on April 15th today as well as them ending and disappearing by may 8th but if you download them in time digitally they're yours to keep now moving forward for the indie developers they're partnering and looking forward to helping them with a 10 million dollar fund but there's more details on that to come in the future Unfortunately, COVID-19 has claimed another victim. The conglomerate known as Indie Mega Booth has ceased operations after nine long years. They organized a lot of in-person events and brought a lot of indie games to the front fold of the industry. They are putting together a Steam sale known as the Going Away For Now sale. One of my favorite game developers, the creators of Halo and Destiny, Bungie, have started a new fundraiser and it has absolutely blown up. Raising over $350,000 within the first 24 hours was incredible and to see it to go to such a noble cause makes it all the more of a blessing. The Guardian's Heart fundraising initiative is to help raise money and get supplies for all the frontline healthcare workers around the world. And even as a little bonus, if you donate $20 or more, you actually receive a bonus emblem, the Guardian's Heart. If you wish to donate, you can simply do so by going to Tiltify. So a couple weeks ago, we were talking about Overwatch's newest character, Echo. Well, guess what? She's in the game now, so let's check her out. And make sure you check out the new competitive mode in the arcade mode. This will run for roughly four weeks and uses the standard competitive play rules, included hero pools and one hero limit, but has no role restrictions or role queues. So make sure you hop on in and check out that new mode. Some of Echo's abilities include her Tri-Shot Primary Fire, which fires three shots at once in a triangular pattern. And don't forget to make sure you use her ultimate, Duplicate, which allows her to take a targeted enemy hero and gain their abilities. And let me tell you, that's a really, really good ability to have in this game.
Here's the highlight of a game coming out to early access in the future. On May 7th, Arborea from All In Games will be on Steam Early Access. And this is a third person roguelike kind of game that I'm definitely into. Uh, it will come out at a lower price than if it were at full release, so check it out now while you can. Well, unfortunately, another crisis in the gaming world arises as one of the world's biggest gaming events closes down yet again. Germany announced that within the country, they banned all major events until August 31st. So our beloved and anticipated Gamescom will not be hosting a live event, but instead they will be hosting a digital event. After finding out this lousy news on April 15th, Gamescom directly tweeted out to all of us that we shall have no fear and that we will still get the same energy and excitement just through the safety from our homes. All right, Drew, let's get ready to lock and load because we're checking out the Wastelands. Nice. Hold them up, Tim November. Black train on the team is shot. But buy me a minute, and I think I can get the weapons online. <laughs> All right, Drew, this week we got to check out Wastelands 3, a uh, top down XCOM action turn based style game. Um, I've played a few of these in the past. Uh, I know you have as well. Yep. Uh, what did you think of this one jumping in? So it's been a while since I played a Wastelands game. Wastelands took a different approach. The other ones you can kind of freely... Well, you know, it's a unique style, to be honest. You can mm -hmm. freely move around. There's kind of two different game modes within the game, right? You got this exploration game mode, which allows you to go out and loot things and explore... And then when you get into combat, then it turns into that turn-based XCOM feel where you're pointing and clicking and dragging your guys yeah. and that kind of stuff. And some people are going to enjoy the fact that you can take your time and set up your, your battles and all that kind of stuff. But it's, when it got started, the opening sequence and how it really kind of draw, drew me into the game, I thought was really cool. The fact that we're going into Colorado and everything just kind of more or less is, kind of goes to hell, right, with, with the Wasteland. Yeah, yeah. And I thought it was really cool. I liked the I liked a lot of formats of these kind of games. I'm a big XCOM fan, so when I saw Wastelands was coming out and they're like, "Yeah, we're going to the third one and we're going to do this," I thought, "Man, this looks pretty cool." And the fact that we were able to get hands on and check it out, I thought, you know what? I like a lot of people are going to like this game. I, I think it's going to have a nice draw for people. And if you're familiar with that XCOM style, then I think you know what? You're in for something pretty cool here. I really enjoyed my time. The time we did get with the game is pretty limited. It's pretty short right now, only a few hours. But still, yeah, we're in a preview build still for the exactly. Game, so yeah, we're only we're only in, yeah only a few hours in the game. Yeah, so we kind of got the foundation of you know what I'm building my group. I've got my rangers ready to go, and then you get your specialists too. So you're starting to build your people, and then, but as you progress through, you're able to kind of work at getting other people and bringing in other skill sets. And there's just a, there's a lot going on even within the few hours I have with the game. Yeah, you know what? This game is really involved. I've played a few styles of games like this before, and you know what? I, I'm definitely into this style of game, this turn-based action. I like the the, the kind of you know the the puzzle aspect of it because it is kind of a puzzle, right? Because you are trying to figure out the best position to be in to yeah. take out your enemies. Because this game does a pretty good job at making you feel overwhelmed almost immediately, um, <laughs> yeah. right after the opening cutscene, which you mentioned was pretty cool. It sets up for kind of an interesting story and kind of immerses you into you know the the story that the two characters that you're going to go on yep. um, or go on with start. 
um, kind of lays it all out for you. And I like the fact that we were able to either just choose pre-built characters that had their own skills and abilities already set, or you have the ability to actually hop in and do a full-on build of the two characters you want to start with, which I thought was a really awesome aspect. And it really opens up to the fact that there's a ton of customization in this game, whether it comes to... Oh, I know there wasn't a ton of visual stuff, at least to start with. And again, preview build, I wasn't even expecting to get as much... Uh, in-depth custom picks as we got to choose when it came to our abilities and skills which in most games abilities and skills usually get wrapped into the same thing in this yeah. game we've got a whole oh, different set of skills a whole different set of abilities yeah and there and the lists weren't small there was a no. lot of things to choose from here and this this is an aspect in this type of game that i wasn't you know previous games like this that i've played haven't really had this or at least this to this degree right it no. felt very in depth for the you know i mean i can every time i level my guy if i gave him a sniper rifle and i gave him you know proficiency in the sniper rifles every level i go up i'm getting some sort of different perk or different stacking ability yeah. and every skiller has that and for me i was like oh this is actually a lot more involved than i thought and that's just when you want to start the game with your two characters so <laughs> it is a lot to take in there it is i felt like it was maybe at first maybe a little overwhelming just because you had to pick all this stuff you weren't sure you know maybe if what you were picking was what you wanted to be using later yeah, on down sure. the road or not right so with options like that it's always kind of difficult but if you've played these styles of games before i think you can kind of get an idea of what you want to play the game like and this really affords you the opportunity to kind of choose your own path so in most games like this style you just kind of you pick your class right but mm -hmm. as you're touching on when you pick your person, but you can actually kind of specify what kind of degree you want to go into as far as, like, I got some going stealth, I got some being a mechanic, and then I got just a full-out assault guy as well. So I'm able to kind of round out my team, but if you want to go and focus in one direction, you can do all these perks and these attributes and all these abilities and focus on that one direction and it allows you into in my play style like i like that stealthy so i made sure i had that stealth person on there so i thought it was really cool i like the character customization options you are did you pick or a pre-made set or did you make your own no i made my own when i realized you could make your own then i, I was really kind of digging around the i went with to, uh, a pre-made set how to, Okay, that's, you know what, yeah. and that was probably the better choice, because <laughs> the set I went with, I went with basically like an assault person, right. that was, you know, guns, a little bit of lock picking, some explosives, yeah. and kind of just tried to make them, you know, you know, a little bit of an all around, and then I, I made it, that was my guy. Sure. Um, and then I made, and then I made a female character and she was a marksman. So she was, she did the robot hacking. She had a sniper nice. rifle. So, and I kind of tried to balance, balance it that way. And it, like, it was, it was cool, but again, they did a pretty good job with some of the pre-made characters cause they all kind of have their own little, like little backstories and their own abilities. So yeah. it, it was pretty cool to see who did you end up going with? Like what style of characters? I went with, so I went with the father daughter combo. So the father oh, was more yeah, of the yeah. melee and then the daughter was that sharpshooter. So I'm like, this is cool i'm able to keep one back and then have one go up right so mm -hmm. i had a play on both sides i thought was pretty good and then the minute i got my actual ranger group together my squad mm -hmm. i then immediately add added an assault i added a medic and i added uh, oh, medic. a stealth oh, player know. as well right so i had a, what i felt like was a pretty well balanced group but then you get into the world and you get out there and you get into you get a hub world your hub world you actually get to upgrade like man i love doing that stuff so i feel like i'm oh, being rewarded as i play and then i'm able to kind of build out my own home base i love doing that kind of stuff so it has that really that good draw for me for wasteland 3 and then when you get out in the world you meet a bunch of quirky characters <laughs> oh yeah dude some There's of these some characters are people. like really over the top but oh, yeah. when you get into dialogue options and this is where you get customization options as well because you're able to take a couple different approaches sometimes you're set with the scenario of you can help this person but the person doesn't want your help so you can either leave them alone or you can kill them or you can just kind of go about and do whatever you want right so i yeah. love this ability and then you know sometimes i was not so nice and other times i was pretty nice <laughs> and i was helpful so i like that i'm able to kind of have this morale sort of light system in a sense and the best part is Corey, is that all the dialogue is voiced 
Yeah, and you know what? It, it was voiced well. Like, I mean, yeah. like you said, there are some over-the-top characters, but their voice acting was done tremendously. And again, for a game that we're just getting a preview of, if this is the preview of what to expect when we do play this game, like, it, it really does a good job at immersing you in the story and kind of the personalities of, of the characters you have on your squad or people you just run into when you are traveling around kind of between combat. Corey, what do you got for final thoughts with Wastelands 3 coming? Well, you know what, Drew? I, I'm definitely a bigger fan of this style of game now that I've played a few. And this one has a bunch of aspects in it that I haven't had in games like this before. So you know what? I'm definitely going to recommend this one, and I'm keeping my eye on it for sure. What do you think? Yeah, you know what? I'm having a great time what I've been able to play so far. I thought the story was interesting enough that it's hooked me. I love all the dialogue choices and the fact that I can build my squad and build up so much more around it and customize who I want to be and all that kind of stuff. I'm hooked. I'm definitely keeping my eye on this one. Hello, everyone out there in the Wasteland. On today's show, I want to talk to you about... Wasteland 3 brings a lot of great tactics elements to the table, including great customization options and the ability to create your starting duo. We're definitely going to be looking for this one upon a full release. If we are fearless against the evils of the world. The guys and I had a discussion not too long ago about what we thought the PlayStation 5 was going to cost. Now, it's Xbox's turn. Well, we all know that the Xbox is just around the corner with the Xbox Series X, but we don't quite know what it's going to cost. Guys, you got any assumptions on what we're going to be paying for this high-end console? The fridge? <laughs> the, the fridge, yeah, yeah. Well, I think this very nice rectangle that we're going to get <laughs> yeah. is, uh, I don't know. When Xbox, One X, or when Xbox One launched, they put it at a $500 price with their Kinect. Yeah. And that really destroyed them because PS4 started at $400 and only had a $400 console. Exactly. So... I think moving forward, they're not going to overprice it. They're not going to be at like some... I don't think it's going to be 600 Right. But I also know that the software and hardware within this is a lot better than what we had before. And they do claim it's supposed to be the most powerful console. <laughs> so I, are we sitting at a $500 price again? Yes. And will we see the same fate because... No. You know, the circumstances <laughs> are different now. You're getting a better console. Right, but you're also now competing with Sony, who's already a higher price range at this time as well, because they don't even have a camera. I don't think it's going to be included with this one, but that you're still going to have that high price range because Sony's face right now with a $600 price. We discussed this as it is, just in parts alone. Yeah. So they, I think, Xbox being they, have the advantage now, and they, they've been holding on to their cards right now as well, right? Everybody's so tight-lipped where they're at with their price that you kind of you kind of speculate where we're going to be and how high do you want to go because xbox doesn't want to do the same thing they did this gen when they launched the xbox one no definitely not you know what they and you know sony's trying to avoid what they did with the ps3 remember that fiasco that was 600 terrible. bucks like, exactly yeah. right so it's, it's, again <laughs> so i mean it's just you know Microsoft is going to try to price it competitively, but they're also, I mean, it's, it's the console wars. It's, we know how it goes, right? Yeah. Sony and Microsoft are going to battle till the end, and people that love Sony are going to keep loving Sony, and people that love Microsoft are going to keep loving Microsoft. But I think this Xbox is going to be more affordable than the PlayStation overall anyways, because I think that's just a strategy that Microsoft is going to go with this year. Because I think, especially with what's going on in the world right now, I think yep. it's going to really come down to what's more affordable in the end, regardless of what technology is in there. Like, yeah. I know PlayStation announced their new DualSense controller, but to Dude, be totally cool. honest, like, I, it looks cool, but yeah. it's technology, again, like the the pad on the PS4 DualShocks that didn't really get used, the gesture pad, right? So it's... I'm, I'm interested to know how much of the technology that's in their new stuff is actually going to be used. So that yeah. jacks their price up. When Xbox kept theirs, you know, they they did improve the controller and they, they changed it. You know, the physical look of it isn't really that much different than what we're used to playing with. So, yeah. you know, maybe that's what helps them keep their price point down. But I would definitely in that, you know, 5 to 550 range. I don't see them going to like 599 or anything like that. Well, that could be maybe five ninety nine Canadian, as we are mm -hmm. kind of known to experience over here in Canada, right? So that's why yeah. on, 
only concern. But yeah, when PlayStation launched the PS3, it was 600 bucks. And they're like, you know what? We are so big right now with the PS2 that you're going to go get another job and buy this PS3. And then we came out and we're like, nope, I'm not getting another job. <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm not getting another job to buy this. And then, <laughs> and then Xbox comes out the following gen and goes, $600. And they were like, nope. I still not well, getting that other job, guys. Like it's just not happening, right? <laughs> Especially yeah. like you said, Corey, right now with everybody and everything going on with COVID nineteen, everybody's wallets are getting real tight. So are yeah. they even going to launch this fall? It's tough, right? That's what yeah. I was thinking I don't before. Know, man. Oh, sorry, Scott. Go ahead. Oh, I was just. That's what I thought before when we were talking about COVID. Was all these games being pushed back? It just. It seems like it's a matter of time that before they just push the consoles back. But then we talked more about. Some of the hardware is already sitting there ready to go so yeah. what do you do with that but if the market isn't gonna buy it if they're not in the right mindset then I'm not sure if there's another choice that, well yeah i see what you're saying scott but at the same time how long do you hold on to your inventory and lose money on that as well yeah yeah because there's a lot of investors right that's Absolutely. the longer you push back it's going to cost microsoft even more money in the end potentially so i it's all like where they're at on the consoles kind of <laughs> i think it is it done like as if it's done then or mostly done then maybe they won't have this problem well you know? phil said phil spencer's been saying he's been playing on it now for months right so the console's built. oh yeah he's got it at home that's what he's playing on now that's what the whole xbox team is playing on right now so but it's ready to so, go here's my thought though the xbox one x was priced at six hundred dollars when it launched, and that's like a mid console, you know, yeah. release. Yeah. So, and what's it priced at now? Brand new. You, you, Is it still five hundred dollars? I think it's still anywhere between four and four fifty Canadian. Yeah. Okay, so it's four hundred. Yeah. So that's just it makes me curious to know if they're gonna just drop the prices sooner. Or if they're gonna do it when they release the Series X, is they're, they're gonna make they're gonna have to make it more enticing. That's it. That's an interesting an interesting angle. They may they may yeah. release the prices earlier just so people are prepared to pay because I don't actually think they're gonna push the console launches. I don't think they can because like especially Microsoft. From what we know with Microsoft, we know they've got units made. I'm sure obviously PlayStation's in the same boat, but we know their window for release happens to just be a little later in the year. We know Xbox was pushing for more of a like a U.S. Thanksgiving, right? So that's gonna be November ish. So, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe they, maybe they do release the prices earlier so people have more time to save money because they're worried when they do release these consoles, you know, will come November, December, January, that, um, you know, that maybe there's just not as many people going out to buy them because that's, a, you know, a, a game console is a luxury as much as we consider it an everyday item. Yeah. Even, you know, it, it, it's not something you should factor into your normal everyday expenses, right? So who knows? Maybe they position themselves, like Nate said, with a, an earlier price out so people understand, you know, what it's actually going to cost to obtain this technology i don't know i just hope it's not too expensive because so. <laughs> exactly well yeah <laughs> right now with everything going on how many people are gaming more now than ever so now oh, it's that, unbelievable exactly so now that you jump in and then say by november we're back to work right hopefully fingers crossed mm -hmm. who knows but if we are then while you've been playing this entire time you're like man i want that next gen now so maybe this might actually kind of favor in a sense for the consoles yeah. so you're getting more people now on their service like microsoft went up for xbox live 40 percent right now because oh, man. of you, you could feel this. the tremor oh in the, in the <laughs> service. Xbox xbox live like of all games were shutting down for like oh man it's been, it's been rocky sometimes right for us to get wow. on and play but we're yeah. playing now more than ever we we have ever been so for that going forward i think it's only going to entice more people to buy the next gen console whether or not people are going to stick around are going to be one thing. So you're getting, I think right now we're getting two two kinds of gamers. One that you've already had the audience and then those who've kind of had friends and get pulled over and pulled in by them go, you know what, I normally play games on my phone. Maybe I'll check out the Xbox. It's been sitting there. My kid's been playing it, whatever. I'll go check it out. So now, now they're playing. So maybe then Halo, 
they jumped into Halo, or who knows what they've been playing, but maybe it's well, them Look in. at Nintendo with the Switch. Oh, Animal yeah. Crossing. The, Nintendo's pr telling people, we're releasing more. We've made more Switches because they sold out of Switches <laughs> everywhere. Because people are playing, you know, people are going home and playing games. Well, and I mean, yeah, Nintendo's definitely a little more of a, a, you know, a viable option when it comes to just going out and buying well, a console. Even though the cheaper. Switch isn't... The Switch, the Switch isn't cheap cheap i mean it's still expensive i mean you're still dropping three three hundred and fifty bucks if you're buying the regular switch yeah but you're not so buying it 500 450 for an x right now either right? again right so i mean people are going in so you're right there's us hardcore gamers that okay well we may have time off from our regular jobs but now we also do this and we just love to game so this is a great opportunity to get in more time for this yeah and we've got all these casual people playing games like animal crossing you know <laughs> and maybe they go from playing the switch now they want a ps5 or they want a new x Xbox Series X. So you're right. People spending time at home playing games means that after this is all said and done and people go back to more of a normal lifestyle, I think there'll be more people gaming than there was before. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. It's absolutely possible. Hit us up at insidethegame.ca and let us know what you think of the Xbox Series X and what its price is going to be. Finally time to wrap up that trilogy, Vader Immortal, Episode 3. Only you can face Vader. Our only hope is to attack his castle. Due to some technical difficulties, I'll be doing this one solo. Drew is waiting for another Oculus controller, but I have my Oculus Rift S to jump into this one. Star Wars, Vader Immortal, Episode 3. And I have to tell you, this one runs pretty well. Now, I have been a little bit spoiled in the recently, in the recent past, with Half-Life Alex and other games, but I'm going to try to not let that creep into this review. Uh, looking at this game on its own, against its own merits, and comparing it against maybe Episode 1 and 2 a little bit. I know you did not choose this path, but our future depends on you. I've actually reviewed episodes 1 and 2 already for the show, so check out our past reviews if you want to learn a little bit more about those in depth. Now this game and how it compares, I have to say, it's probably mm, my second favorite, but I'll get into that a little bit later. This game picks up right where the story left off, it's the trilogy end cap, and you know that it's going into that act 3. There's a lot of consequences, and the first two games were kind of a prepper. The first one was a little bit more adventure-y, action-y, uh, had some combat in there, and was very story-driven. The second episode was a little bit lackluster. I feel like the story was very important, they told a necessary chunk, but there wasn't a lot of action, and it was very uh, left a lot to be desired. This third game has filled in with a lot of the action, and of course that crescendo of episode 3 for the story. Getting into the action though, they've changed a couple things. So now, right off the start in the dojo, you can go with dual lightsaber. You can also throw your lightsaber and pick up a blaster off of a dead enemy. These are all kind of new tweaks on the past and in the past dojos as well. You've had the ability to use force powers, but not grab a gun and start firing back. So that's really cool. A little bit of inconsistency though, in the story mode, you never learn how to use two lightsabers. You never learn how to throw your lightsaber. So it's kind of interesting that they kind of put these into the dojo, but not the actual flushed out story mode. The story mode this time around has quite a few action packed sections. Um, there's one that I don't really enjoy. Uh, you're on top of a skiff. It's like a floating platform, essentially a shooter on rails. And that's my least favorite thing for VR. I feel like in this case, it wasn't terrible. It just went on a little bit too long, maybe, in place of some other content. Uh, the battle sequences are cool, but you can kind of see the seams, I feel like. Their production just wasn't quite that polished. I don't know if they're trying to rush it out the door versus the first episode. 
that was very detailed, but this one was just lacking a little bit of that polish. Um, certain enemies in the background, they kind of fade away. Uh, the laser shots from the big turret just kind of seem weird and disconnected. Um, just some little kind of nitpick things in the action sequences. That first game was very detailed. Episode 1 and 2, when you're following Vader, really got to show you the level of textures and uh, the, the quality they put into the character models. All those characters are here. Uh, they have a little bit more use. I still don't like the droid very much, but she has a purpose in the story, and at least it, she became useful. Um, some of the other characters, they kind of don't seem to acknowledge you exactly, or they go into almost a cinematic trance before they snap out of it and find you wherever you are in the room. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting. Again, I just I just don't know if it was a little bit of a, a rushed attempt, but the game is very short. Just like episode two, this one comes in at about 40 minutes, uh, maybe a little bit longer than episode two. Uh, certainly feels longer because there's a lot more weight to the story and a lot of the action is a little bit more interesting. Instead of just throwing things around with the force, you can pick guys up throw them at each other, uh, you can grab their blaster and fire back. That made it all a lot more fun, but maybe it kind of sped me through those events. I feel like they weren't as long as maybe they could have been, or maybe I am just have that insatiable thirst for lightsaber combat. This was a lot more of a shooting gallery than it was uh, lightsaber clashing. It really doesn't come up until the end, but again, I don't want to get into too many of the details here. I just want to tell you a little bit about the game and, and why I liked it. I did actually like it. I know I might be nitpicking here, but this is always fun to put a virtual reality goggle set on, no matter what it is, and play anything Star Wars, no matter what the quality. That's just a dream that everybody has, and it definitely gives you that moment of power throughout this episode a couple times. You. So, you survived the caverns. No matter, you've arrived too late. The dojo is where you go to play out more and play that flushed out combat if you so desire. I just wish there was a little bit more lightsaber combat in that specifically. Being that it's such a short experience, I'm kind of glossing over things on purpose. I don't want to give it away, and I don't want to ruin that experience for anybody that is going to play it. I do recommend this one, although like I said, it is my second favorite in the series. The first episode was definitely the, the leading punch, uh, the second one was a bit of a letdown, and this one picks it up quite a bit, but still kind of leaves a little bit to be desired. Again, maybe that's just the environment we live in now. Virtual reality is getting better, and they're going to have to make everything better to compete. But I cannot wait for that. These games are just getting better and better, and this one personally gets a 7 from me. Episode 3 improves on storytelling and is a short yet sweet ending to the trilogy. The combat is the best of the series, and the added gunplay was great. Time for one final lesson. This long distance relationship is a fold apart. I jumped into a very unique title this week, and I'm talking about A Fold Apart. This game is based off an actual relationship. Mark, one of the creators of the game, actually is telling a story from his perspective on what it's like to be faced in a long distance relationship. 
Now, the overall story I thought was rather touching and telling of what maybe it might be like for someone to be in this situation. I personally wouldn't know from experience. However, seeing from what Mark is kind of going through here with this title, this one was pretty cool to see. It was very touching and very telling from his two perspectives of the characters. You play a male and a female, essentially Mark, the, one of the creators, and his girlfriend, and it tells a story of how Mark more or less set off to go into the, another part of the world as he went and followed his dreams to become an architect or, or a dream job of his, we'll say. And as he's doing this, but he's kind of got faced with these text messages back and forth of how they care about each other, but then as the text message starts to kind of wrap up, you get hit with the scenario of, oh, I wish you were here, or, yeah, that was nice, but it would have been better if you were here. So you kind of get that feeling, almost like a sense of guilt. And then from when you get that guilt and that little trip out part, it then kicks into the gameplay. And the gameplay is these unique puzzles that is set on paper, and basically you're folding the paper to solve the puzzles and move on to the next level. I thought it was really well done and smartly designed for these puzzles. I thought it was really cool. I thought the art approach was really well designed, simplistic but yet telling. As the mood changes throughout the story of the game and the relationship extends, you see their perspectives change from a colorful bright palette to something that's a little more cool and sad feeling. So it was able to kind of progress along as the game moved along as well and you kind of you get that sense of as the relationship is further apart due to long distance and the fact that the time is stretching out from maybe a month six months to a year you start to get the sense of loneliness being from one perspective to another and the art kind of matched along with it i thought it was really really well done the music goes along with the art style as well being simplistic but i found after a while it almost felt repetitive as well so you kind of had this feeling where again you're getting over the same things you're heading in these puzzles but yet you're getting the same music to go along in the background and it would have been nice to have a little bit more variety Instead of a loop kind of going through as you kind of went along with the story. All in all, I had a great time playing a fold apart. You get the sense of highs and lows with the relationship from both perspectives. A lot of text and dialogue on screen was able to help push that forward giving you the full story, but yet leading into inquisitive puzzles and challenging puzzles at times as well. I was stuck there for a while, and if you do get stuck, you do have the ability then to help out with hints that will help you proceed through that challenge and kind of progress further along with the story. The game is there to meant, it's more meant to push you along for the story and not so much for the challenging on the puzzles. But if you want that puzzle challenge, some of them get really tough. Overall, my time with the Fold Apart was a fantastic experience. I thought the story was really done well. The art style was good. The music matched, but at the same time, I felt like it kind of looped a little bit too much. Overall, my time with the game, I'm scoring it a 7.5. Touching story about the troubles of having a long distance relationship and some unique paper folding puzzles. Having more variety in the score would have been a nice touch. Well, Scott, we're heading in other unknown alien-like waters on the Switch. All right, Scott, so we got In Other Waters on the Switch, and this is kind of a different game for me. I'm pretty sure it's a pretty different game for you, too. It's kind of this very peaceful, I don't know, exploration-style game. Yeah, that's kind of how I would say it. It's um, You're dealing with an interface in instead of dealing with like a character. 
So there is a character exploring these alien oceans, and that's kind of just the premise. You're the suit accompanying this character. So instead of doing the actions yourself, you're kind of um, hanging radars and doing extraction work and exploring and kind of giving intelligence. It's from a different perspective. Basically just a 2D adventure game, though. Yeah, man, you're... Most of the game consists of you scanning the area, finding different alien life forms with a little description, and then finding the next uh, movement point, per se. And then, eventually, you kind of get some obstructions where you have to start using some of the resources from the map, because also, while you're going to some of these different spots and moving, you're actually collecting data from these aliens. And some of it you end up, sorry, using to, you know, move forward in the map. So one of them was, you know, you kind of like almost like plant a seed and then a whole bunch of spores would spawn in and it would block a high current place. So you're able to move forward in the next location. So there wasn't really like the puzzling was kind of minimal, but it's still like it kind of made me sit there for a couple seconds because you have to use, you know, the samples you're collecting. If you don't really understand what's going on um, and how these items interact, maybe you weren't paying attention when the text came by. It's a very text-heavy game. Um, oh, there's you no diet. Like, there's no people talking. It's all strictly text. Yeah. Uh, you might not know what interacts with what and what your options are when you're granted with something uh, like a high current or just these kind of algae that you don't want to move through. They block your path, and you just have to put... Something that reacts kind of like a bomb on top of it. Uh, it yeah. blows it up and clears the way. So there's kind of these ways of interacting with the world um, as you're moving this character through it on your path. Um, it looks kind of basic, though. I have to comment on the The, the user interface is nice and clean. Um, everything kind of makes sense. With It took me a while to get my head around how to navigate, but once you kind of understand what you're doing, which I found there wasn't much of a tutorial, no, per se. No, not like, really. For this style of game, I, I, like, I kind of felt a little lost at the beginning. But once I kind of got my hands on it and, you know, progressed through the story, <clears throat> it actually kind of made more sense. And it's, it's just kind of a, a peaceful exploration game. You're trying to find this other person that's also been exploring, and then there's kind of mystery within that as well. Yeah, they do a good job of trying to, um, the way your character speaks to you, as if you're a sentient AI, and just kind of the way they build that character. Parsonis, kind of a familiar name to us too, so it's kind of funny, but um, yeah. that kind of inter-character mystery of where's my friend, you know, what are they doing on this island, or this planet, and what happened to their research, and because when you land, you think you're the first person to discover this alien race. Yeah, but then there's more of a mystery to it, as you realize there's kind of been more of a timeline to it. But I think they went with very a story-driven narrative. But just when it's delivered through text and uh, such a plain-looking world, uh, it's colorful, but it's not really... It's left for your imagination. Because, yeah. you know, when you go back to the home base, they have even more descriptions for all these different life forms and stuff. So it's really it's really good at painting the picture in your mind. But again, it's it's never something you actually see. It's all through text. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very interesting that they decided to, to do that. Um, it kind of strips away some of the more flashy elements that we see in games now and replaces it with, you know, maybe more of a narrative-driven, um, casual experience. But yeah. Uh, there's not a lot of audio to be to be said to add to this. There's a kind of an ambient soundtrack. Um, every device has its pings and whatever, but there's no voiceovers. Yeah, there's uh, not really any sort of exciting music. Um, it's very basic on that level. Maybe with if they had some more kind of underwater undertone music to kind of go along with the setting, it might've helped, but it just to me, all in all, the game was kind of boring for the most part. It, it really was unexciting. Yeah. It's unfortunate. Well, I, I think we've just about covered 
everything there is to cover in this game. Um, I played and had a good time, but was kind of falling off. I don't really have too much that draws me to it again and again, um, but I didn't have a bad time, that's for sure. I'm gonna give this one a five out of 10. All right, man, I'm a little bit higher than you, but all in all, my experience was that it was just a little dry, but I did like, you know, the detail that they put into the alien life forms as far as text goes, but I'm going to have to give this one a 5.5. A unique 2D adventure game that leaves a lot to the imagination. It is well made, however, we found the action to be a bit dull. So the final day has come and gone and we have officially wrapped up the season for Rainbow Six Siege Pro League. This day was the determining factor who places where in the leaderboards to claim victory of the season. There were a few matches that were do or die and let's hop right into that. Starting off the day was Evil Geniuses vs E United on Clubhouse. Evil Geniuses have been struggling a lot this year but have started to gain a bit of a foothold during the second half of the season. On Monday, they showed off how a sort of reckless playstyle wins games. Evil Geniuses had a strong start while defending, taking five rounds, which ultimately led to their victory of seven to two over E United. E United has had a tough time against lower tier teams, but for some reason, they always do really well against higher bracket teams. Regardless, it was still an awesome game and I look forward to seeing both of these guys next year. Heading into the second match, we had Dark Zero against Luminosity Gaming on Coastline. Luminosity Gaming was in the fight for 5th place and needed this victory to help solidify that. Dark Zero Esports, on the other hand, was sitting comfortably in 3rd place and, well, they had very little hopes for making 2nd. Both Hot and Cold and Mint popped off with some 4k rounds and in my opinion are the reason Luminosity Gaming did not win. The third match of the day was the and all be all, the big Cheddar, the Rocket. It was the duel of two titans with Space Station Gaming versus TSM on Theme Park. TSM just needed to secure a tie to get first place for the season and they just couldn't pull through. A 7-5 heartbreaking defeat left TSM in second place while the reigning world champs secured first. Playing on theme park, by the way, was amazing to see because we have zero data on both these teams for this map. They have never played it before in the pro league. So between the rarity of seeing theme park, the battle between arguably the best teams in the world and it being my favorite map, what an amazing match. The final match of the day was an important one, Tempo Storm fighting Team Reciprocity. This game was a bit of a blowout as Tempo Storm played again on one of their better maps, Cafe. Tempo Storm came rushing in like a typhoon and swept away the match with a 7-1 victory almost a clean sweep. Tempo Storm needed this win as it put them directly in fifth place for the end of the season. So there it is, the end of the season and the standings to go with it. It's a little bit odd because we won't be getting our usual tournaments and games in the upcoming months and weeks, but nonetheless we still have more games to look forward to hopefully by the end of the year. 
I'll keep you updated with any word or news on the upcoming season, but with COVID-19 still on the rise, who really knows? It's been awesome being able to give you guys the latest coverage on Rainbow Six Siege Pro League, so enjoy the rest of these highlights and catch you next time. Nate, it's no secret, we are Rainbow Six Siege fans here, and we are back to check out the Battle Pass. Oh yeah. Well Nate, you and I dove into the Battle Pass. This is, what, like second attempt I guess at this Battle Pass? They had a mini Battle Pass, and now this is their attempt at kind of having a more flushed out Battle Pass. How is this... We'll call it Season 2 Battle Pass sitting with you. Well, man, it's not really sitting too well in yeah, my yeah. tummy this time uh, around yeah. either. So to begin with, the first Battle Pass that came out, I thought wasn't that great. The content itself, like the skins and whatever you got within it, wasn't that great. And then right. the amount of coin that you would receive, as well as uh, the loot bags or loot packs, Yep. You didn't really, in my opinion, get what you paid for. And this time moving forward, the only thing that I really liked were about three or four of the skins. And again, not much else. Well, it's a weird format that Ubisoft has taken with their Battle Pass compared to others like PUBG or Fortnite or even Apex. You know, you got the top three to follow suit with kind of... Not, you don't have to battle with them, but at the same time, take snippets of what they do well and then implement it into your own system, your own format. And, but I don't feel you, Ubisoft have taken that approach. What they've done is they've given you a month to do your battle pass. So you have the time period of the month with four challenges, which is so bizarre to me. Because when we do a typical battle pass, you have... Here's week one, and a list of your challenges to complete to help progress you through and along to tier 100. In this battle pass, there is tier 35. So already, you're not even at half, you are lower than half of a typical battle pass. Well, uh, for, let's say, Apex Legends, for the exact same price, actually priced less because Apex is, I believe, a thousand gold coins, which is just $10. Okay. So, with that $10 price, you get 110 levels worth of content, and over the course of three to four months. Whereas this one, you get about a third of that, <laughs> and it's the same price, if not a little more. And in also, one thing too, with the Rainbow Six Siege Battle Pass, you get about 800 silver in return for fully completing it. Whereas in Apex Legends, if you fully complete it or get close to it, you get the full rewards back in return. Yeah. So what I don't really understand, these games are also free-to-play <clears throat> games. So people have already spent money on Rainbow Six Siege in one way or another. So to have a kind of a little more of aggressive a take on the Battle Pass, I just don't, it's not really sitting well with me. No, it's a, it's, that's why I said, it's a unique spin on how they've taken their approach for their Battle Pass. I'm not, honestly, a big fan of how they've taken it again to do this. I, I like, so I come from the world of PUBG, and, and you get your coins, and then as you build up, and you make it to tier 100, or not even, to be honest, tier 90 to 95, you've then yeah. accumulated enough coins, enough in-game currency, to buy next season's Battle Pass. Here... For us, if you own year five of your operators and then you get the battle pass, it's 840 R credits, okay? But as you play throughout the month, you only get 600 credits. So hmm. you don't even get enough to buy next season. They are making you spend more money to buy the next season. Now, they already have an in-game store. That you can go to and spend all kinds of money on skins, charms, you name it. Whatever you want to do, right? So why not reward us with grinding through? 
but in other battle passes they don't last just one month nate they go no, for man. two months right uh pubg is an eight week cycle you say an apex is about a three month cycle somewhere in around there three to four months exactly yeah. so we have time to build over this here we have right from the get-go you get four challenges on what to do so right there's explosive challenge uh the secondary gun challenge flashbang flashbang and there was one other one that was pretty easy as well well, they always had a community challenge every week. So it's community-based. Yeah. So really, your contributions are 0.00% of whatever. So even if you played, maybe if you played for a week straight every day for eight hours, you might contribute 0.005%. <laughs> yeah. So like, There's a just... lot of people playing. Overall, Nate, let's score the Battle Pass. We'll call it Season hmm. 2 Rainbow Six Siege Battle Pass. I think it's a step up from what they did previously, but still yeah. a step down from where we're at with other seasons of Battle Passes from other games. What do you score in this one? Well, man, after <laughs> I don't know how many missions we've we're approximately somewhere in around did, maybe 100 80 matches, <laughs> to yeah. 100. But 100. After matches. doing that many missions on casual, mostly... I don't know. I'm going to have to give this a four, man. I hate mm -hmm. to be so low with it, but they just, they're not really giving as much as they should with the amount that you, they expect you to pay. Yeah. I'm there a little bit higher than you. I, I like some of the skins that kind of kept me going. I love Valkyrie skins. Castle's got a cool skin, but he's ready at the very beginning, so I need something to entice me more. They need to have a bigger, better battle pass moving forward. I'm there with a five. Well, that'll wrap up this week's show. Now, each and every week, you guys head us up and end off our show with a highlighted clip. This week, we have Shinkaro checking it out in the Division 2 going rogue. So let's check this out, and we'll see you next week inside the game.